was talking to Pastor J.D. before service. He travels a lot, preaches in a lot of places, a lot of churches all around the country. And it's his observation that many of them are just dying. They're just dying. They're just dying. Uh, places where he pastored, places where he planted, places where he sent missionaries that were thriving. Hundreds of people now are down to 6, 12 people, and they don't seem to know what to do. That's, that's tragic. That's tragic. The Spirit of God, the power of God, the presence of God, just to call God into a place and seek Him until He shows up. I know it's not, everybody is not comfortable with that kind of worship. I understand that. But you, but you need to because heaven's going to be like that, you know. I think heaven's going to be a lot like that. So we'll, we'll just enjoy that. But God is pouring out His Spirit. And this morning, before I do anything, if ever you wondered if a, if a moment was ordained of God, it, it is this moment. It is this moment. This is a moment, and I'm determined not to miss it for any reason. But when we come in for team huddle and it turns into a revival, before we even get started, man, it's like, hello, Jesus. I should let Kathy preach this morning and just turn her loose because it was powerful. This morning, God is here, and I'm praying that he's going to bless all of your lives before you walk out of this door. Amen? Welcome one another. Take time to say hello to one another. Let them know you're glad to have them here. Tell them, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready for what God is going to do and say and do in your life, my Lord. Come on, Jesus. Woo. Come on, take your time, say hello, shake hands. You're the friendliest face some of them have seen all week long. As we go launch this morning, I just say greetings to everyone. Glad to have you with us today. We are blessed that you are here. We never take it for granted that you show up, whether you're visiting for the first time or first time in a long time, or if you are a long-time member of our house, we don't take it for granted that you're here. You drove by 62 other churches to get here, and I appreciate that. We're glad that you're in the house this morning. and pray that God will bless you, and, and I sometimes always forget to say hello to everybody that is online, so hello, everyone that is online. Um, there was a young man watching from Uganda just a few minutes ago when I was back and coming out. So if, that is, if that's you and you're still there, God bless you. Thank you for being there. We're happy that you're with us and everybody else that's there. We're, come on, we're glad that you are there. What a day. What a day. I'm so glad you're here. Anybody in a hurry? Good. Just chill a minute and, uh, and just relax into it. Um, it's summertime. It's July. And I just walk outside and get mad. I'm born and raised in this, y'all. And doesn't it just feel like it's getting hotter every year? Now, I said in the winter that I was not going to complain about the, the heat of this summer. But I lied. I'm complaining. It's hot, y'all. And so if we can come into an air conditioner. As a matter of fact, each of you guys on that side, if you will, tick that down two notches. Just two more notches. Because just... I'm going to preach a little bit before I leave here today. And I'm getting tired of going home and sweating through my shirts. So today is going to be a good day in the Spirit of God. We're glad that you're here. Don't leave unless you have to, because right on to the end of this service today, we're going to pray for people that desperately need it, and God's going to do some amazing things in your life. We're glad that you're here. If you have your Bible, open with it to John chapter 7. I want to begin today with a statement that some, I'm sure, will excitedly agree with. They will thank God for it, and they will pray that God will give us more of that kind of thing. Others will hesitate. My, my opening remark is going to cause some hesitation because you weren't raised like that. You haven't been brought up in that situation, and so you're trying to, trying to understand as it goes. And then some will, I'm sure of this, absolutely resist it uh, because it is definitely not something that, that fits into your theological belief system. But the statement is this, that in my 46 years as a disciple of Jesus Christ, closely following Him as closely as I can, with 40 years of that being in full-time pastoral ministry, 37 of that having been right here, here is the statement, we need the Holy Spirit. Yes. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, in our church, in our country, in our state houses, in our courthouses, in our schools. We need the Spirit of God. I don't think there has ever been a time when it is more necessary for believers to be filled with, led by, empowered by, and baptized in the Holy Spirit of God. 
than it is right now. We need the Holy Spirit. We need His presence. We need His power. We need His purity. We need His personality. We need the gifts. We need the fruit of the Spirit of God. We need the influence of the Spirit of God. And I truly, um, just as a man saying something, I, I don't have any idea why anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus would even try to make it through a single day of their life without crying out sometime through that day, Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit of God, I need you. I need you now more than I've ever needed you. And, and I want you to understand as we go forward, that, that is not a denominational statement, so don't relegate it to that. Don't relegate that to a denominational statement because it is not. Those are literally the words of Jesus. John chapter 7 starting in verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. The word thirst in that verse means a strong sensation of dryness in your life. It is a strong desire that you have. He, verse 38, he that believeth in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, which is the symbol of a perpetual blessing and perpetual refreshing. In verse 39, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This morning, I want to go after something that may feel less like a sermon and more like a, a mandate or a mission statement. I want to go after something this morning uh, that I believe that God has not only given me to give to you, but has prepared you to receive. He has prepared you to receive it. He has confirmed your, by your presence here. He has confirmed it time after time, even in the songs that we were singing this morning. So let's just obey God and let's just let the Holy Spirit show up. Amen? Amen. If you were here last week, the subject that we dealt with was exhaustion. After having done this for so many years, whenever you deliver a word like that from time to time, you, sometimes you hope that there was something in that for somebody because you can't really tell. But, and then there are other times when you are absolutely sure that whatever it was that God spoke in that moment was exactly what people in that room needed to hear because it just it, 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 it sparks something in not just yourself, but it, it sparks something that moves through the people that are assembled there. The word for the day was exhaustion. And last week was one of those times when I was absolutely convinced that the word that was given in that moment was exactly what God wanted us to hear in that moment because within 24 hours, that sermon had been viewed over 750 times. In one, in one 24 hour span, somewhere in this world, 750 times, people took the time to watch that. My phone started blowing up that afternoon as people reached out to me and said, Pastor, 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 that, that, that word, that is exactly how I felt. And there was something that was being said that touched something inside of people. The word for the day was exhaustion, being tired. I said that there were a lot of causes for that. There were a lot of reasons that people find themselves in a, in a posture of being exhausted. Um, sometimes you're exhausted because you just think you can do everything. That super syndrome that people live with that thinks, well, I, you know, I can do everything. There's nothing I can't do. And so you jump out of bed every day and you attack life as if it is something to be conquered. And you're just going to show everybody else that I got this and I can, I can do this. And, I, and sometimes you're exhausted because you take on too much. You have no boundaries. You don't know how to tell people no. You don't know how to hold some things at arm's length and and say, I'll get to that when I can get to it. Other, other times, it's because you just simply don't take care of yourself. I'm a huge fan of self-care. I'm a huge fan of you taking care of yourselves. You've got to, it sounds so carnal, but you've got to sleep right. You've got to eat right. You've got to take care, you've got to de-stress your life. You've got to be able to live your life. Sometimes you, you don't take care of yourself and you break down. Sometimes it's because of the ungodly or the unhealthy lifestyle that you just, you live. Y'all need to remember this, the way of the transgressor is hard. Huh? You're not as young as you used to be. You can't drink until four in the morning and go to work at seven. Them hangovers get worse as you get older, am I telling the truth? 
Hmm, the devil is a liar. But lastly, the observation I gave you was that for many people it was a revelation that came out of 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8. The Bible says that about Lot that living where he lived, 2 Peter 2, 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them vexed his righteous soul from day to day, seeing and hearing their godless deeds. I said that exhaustion can come about simply by living in an ungodly culture. And for some people, that was an aha moment. Because some people have never known that. You never heard that. It just I'm say it again. Living in an ungodly culture can cause exhaustion. It is a constant drain on your life. It's a constant drain on your spirit. It's a constant drain on who you are. The proximity and association of it all has an effect on you. And you say, no, it doesn't. Well, then you're better than Jesus. Because it even affected Jesus the same way. Study his life and you'll see that after every time and period of intense ministry, Jesus would leave. He didn't just jump up and go do it again. He would leave. He would go off into a place to pray. And what he was doing in that time was he was shaking a lot of that off. And he was re-preparing himself to engage again. Living in an ungodly culture definitely affects us whether we recognize it or not, whether you notice it or not. When you get around positive people, it starts to become the natural tendency of your life to become positive also. When you get around negative people, you may not be one of those people. You may not. You're always bright and cheery, but watch me. You get around a negative person for 20 minutes, and the next thing you know, you're complaining just like they are. Angry, mean, bitter people. Next thing you know, you're the same way. And sometimes you have to look at yourself and realize that when I'm starting to get things, do things that I don't normally do, and I'm behaving like I don't normally behave, I need to check my associations. You get around joyful people. I can't stand those people. They're happy about everything. Yay, Jesus, you know. But it rubs off on you, and the next thing you know, you're like, well, I'll just be happy too. It happens. When you get around people with certain habits, ill tempers, um, bad language. <laughs> yeah, I know who I'm preaching to. <laughs> you hadn't cussed in 15 years. Next thing you know, you sound like you used to sound. Bad behaviors, addictions. Whatever it is that is in them or on them has a way of affecting who you are. It affects you personally. I remember clearly, vividly, when I was a young man trying to live a, a wild life, my dad would repeatedly drop 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 down on me. I mean, it was constant. I could, I could, I, here it comes. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, my dad would say, Be not deceived. Evil associations corrupt good morals. Birds of a feather flock together. Show me your friends. That, that word in that verse, evil associations corrupt good manners. It means that it shrivels, withers, wastes, spoils, and ruins. And so, as we extrapolate that thought into the culture that we are living in, the time that you and I happen to find ourselves living in, you can start to see how it begins to have its effect on us, each of us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this know also that in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful to parents, unholy, without natural affection, having a form of godliness but denying the, the power thereof. When you see that in the culture that is around you, all of that has its way of affecting the spiritual life that you live. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, all of those things. Unfortunately, that is the world that we live in. You don't have a choice about that. That is the world that, that we live in, and that has an effect on you every day as you live your life. That 2 Peter 2.8 came as a revelation to a lot of people. That Lot, just by virtue of the fact that he lived in that city of Sodom and Gomorrah, that vexed him day after day. It wore him out. Recently, I went looking for a word to describe how I've been feeling in my spirit lately. I try to be as mindful about myself as I can, and the word that I came up with was a simple word. Here it is, uncomfortable. 
That's the word that I feel like I'm living my life right now. I find myself more and more uncomfortable in the world as it is. Uncomfortable. Not intimidated. <laughs> oh, come on. Not at all. Ah, the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not intimidated by their faces or their words or their threats. I'm not afraid. I'm not scared. I'm not worried. I'm not wringing my hands wondering what's going to happen. God's got it, y'all. He's got it. The word that I'm feeling is uncomfortable. Now, if I was in an old church where there was old people, somebody might have started singing with me, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Somebody might have gone there in your spirit. Monday night I, was, I went to bed, I was restless. My wife for 42 years can tell you that one thing that does not escape me is sleep. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. I'm asleep right now. I can sleep anywhere, anytime with my eyes wide open. You're talking to me and you think I'm listening to you. I ain't hearing you. I'm asleep. <laughs> I can sleep. I went to bed and I was restless. I couldn't find sleep that night. And I, this time I know the Spirit of God well enough to know that it was not insomnia. I don't let that happen to me because the Bible says they will lay down in peace and they will sleep. And this is what it came to, that as we live in a world right now that has lost its way, where sin is normalized and the church world seems to be satisfied with entertaining itself every Sunday by playing dress up, not only do we need the Holy Spirit of God, but we need Him now more than we have ever needed Him. We need, I'm going to preach before I get out of here. We need him now more than we have ever needed him in any of our lives. And adding this to that, we don't need to relegate him to some place or some room in the church or some place or something that we can let our Pentecost come out. We need to emphasize everything about him. At every chance that we get who he is and what he does. Because whether we notice this or not, whether we meant to or not, in large degree, the church of this hour, largely, has relegated the Holy Spirit to somewhere near the back of the bus in favor of great services, good vibes, fuzzy feelings, emotionalism, and happy people. It seems as though every church service these days is supposed to try to make everybody as happy as possible. And we feel like we've done a good job if everybody leaves happy. No, no, no. Sometimes you need to leave mad. Sometimes, even, even during the sermon, you need to think about, I'm going to pick up my Bible. I'm walking out of here. I'm leaving. If he didn't look so mean, I'd leave right now. We're living in a time, y'all, where the spirit-filled life is needed right now. The spirit-filled life is so much more than all of that. It is more than great services, feelings, emotions, goosebumps, and gifts. We're living in a time when goosebumps and great vibes are not enough. They're not enough. We're living in a time when great services are not enough. Great services, even as much as I love them, even if it's a good service every Sunday, is not enough. Because I'll promise you this, y'all will leave out of here this morning having been immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and by tomorrow, somebody's going to be on your last nerve. Maybe tonight. We need the Holy Spirit of God. One of the reasons that sin is so prevalent, both inside and outside of the church, is because of a noticeable lack of emphasis on the Holy Spirit. In this case, with emphasis on the first word, holy. It's not a cuss word in church. I preached to the church this morning, in our rush to be relevant, and it seems like every church is trying to be so relevant these days. In our rush to be relevant, we have substituted holiness for happiness. Godliness for goodness. 
sanctification for sensitivity, separation for sameness, and boldness. That, that boldness that many of us were raised on has taken a back seat to now being liked and never offending anyone. You can never not offend somebody. One of the reasons that lukewarmness is so prevalent is because we've all but forgotten the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters, in John 16 and 8, Jesus said when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Conviction is a powerful thing. Three people believe that. Conviction is a powerful thing that needs to be felt in the house of God. It needs to be felt. Conviction is when you know that you know that you know that something that you are doing is not right. It's just not right. And I may not like it, but I know that it needs to be made right. I was born as, and raised in this atmosphere, y'all. I remember as a little boy sitting in service after service after service, knowing the stuff that I had been doing, listening to the preacher preach, and knowing down inside of me, I need to make this right. I need to make this right, preacher. If you just stop talking, I'll go up there to the altar right now, because I need to make this right. And it happened, y'all, because preachers preached. And because the Holy Spirit spotlight shined down on whatever it was that we were trying to hide in our lives. And I'm telling y'all, we need that again. We need that Spirit of God spotlight to shine down on our lives. To show us what we are doing that we can't be doing. Anxiety and depression right now are at all-time highs. Even though the Scripture clearly declares Him as the Comforter. We need the Holy Spirit, y'all. John 16, 7, Jesus said, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But when I go, I will send him to you. He, what? He will send you the Comforter, the one who comforts us. There is no replacement or substitute for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. None whatsoever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Bible says, He is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles. Y'all, hear me what I'm saying. If we believe that, every counseling ministry would be closed tomorrow, including mine. If we believe that. If we would seek His presence instead of educated people. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Okay. That's how I know I'm right. When y'all get quiet like that, that's when I know I've shook the tree and I'm going to shoot whatever falls out of it. Shake the tree and shoot whatever falls out of it. We seek the wisdom of educated people, and there's nothing wrong with that. But let me tell you, those educated people probably got more problems than you do. And what you need to be doing is seeking God, taking all of your cares and burdens and needs and troubles, your messed up wiring, and throw it down at his feet and say, God, I'm a messed up person, but I know that I need you. And let the Holy Spirit change your life. We need him. One of the reasons, one of the reasons why the devil is free to do everything that he does is because we don't know what we need to know. In John 14 and 26, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance that I have said to you. All things. You ever find yourself in a situation where there's something that you need to, to know or say and you can't quite get it. And you get so frustrated when what you should have done is just whisper that little prayer inside, Holy Spirit. Amen. Give me something right now. Amen. Some of us are so Pentecostal that we pray like that when we lose our keys. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. Lost my keys. You know who knows where they are? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> he does. Y'all say, that's crazy. No, that's true. In a world, in a world right now that is filled with confusion and deception, we need the spirit of truth. Like we've never needed the spirit of truth to show us the difference between right and wrong and good and evil in this culture. In John 16, 13, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you into all truth. The indwelling of the spirit of God in your life will tell you what is of God and what is not of God. And the church world of this age right now desperately needs a crash course in what is of God and what is not of God. We need it. We need it. Next week I'm going to the church down the street. Well, I got you today. We need a crash course in knowing what is of God and what is not of God. 
People throwing around things that they say is godly is not. The indwelling of the Spirit of God will show you the difference. In a world that is filled with fear, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that the problem is not fear. The problem is not fear. The problem is a lack of the right kind of fear. I hear smart people say things that are so stupid (laughs) that I wonder, do they fear God at all or not? And the answer is no, they don't. Because if they feared God, they would not be saying the things that they say. When they can cast an unborn child's life aside as if it does not matter, and then they say that they're doing that because it's the right thing to do. It's wrong. We need to understand. We need to have a different kind of fear. In a world that is filled with hate, and somebody just, you know, you, you wanted to throw that one at me. You, why do you hate people? In a world that is filled with hate, we need the Holy Spirit to show us how to love. Yeah. Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God has been spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that God has given to us. Show me someone who hates on everybody, and I will show you someone who needs a new baptism. Yeah. They need a new baptism in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. When I need help. He is my helper. When I don't know how to pray, He prays for me. When I forget what I said I would never forget, He has a way of reminding me. When I am broken, He steps in and holds my life together. When everything in me wants to retaliate to everything that is going on around me, Galatians 5 reminds me that the fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in my life is love, joy, Peace, patience. I wish that wasn't in there. (laughs) Got to be a typo. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. In an increasingly uncomfortable world, he is the comforter. Another old song. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. I didn't forget the words. For the hand of God in all my life I see. And the secret of my, of my bliss. And the reason for my bliss. Yes, the secret all is this. That the comforter abides with me. He abides. He abides. Hallelujah. He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter of my... No Pentecostals in here, not one. <laughs> in a lost world. And that's probably the best term that we can use to describe this world today. In a lost world, we need a Savior. He's not in the White House. He's, he's not in the White House. He's not in the courthouse. He's not in the schoolhouse. We need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And we also need the one that brings us to Him. Theologically, again, according to John chapter 6 and verse 44, no man can be saved except the Spirit of the Lord draw him. You can't even be saved without the Holy Spirit of God drawing you to that salvation. We don't need the Holy Spirit. Yes, you do. Passive people. Passive people are about to choke. Because the word in that verse literally means to drag. It's the same word that's used in John six twenty or John 21 where a heavy catch of fish was dragged to the shore. No man can be saved unless the Spirit of God drags him sometimes. How many of y'all was dragged to Jesus? You reprobates. He dragged you to a salvation because he loves you. I want to see lost people born again. I want to see that. I want to see people with tears crying through to get saved. In a world that is filled with victims who feel powerless and overwhelmed And overpressed by the devil. Jesus said, listen to me, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Brothers and sisters, these are the days that we need that power. Sometimes you get so ashamed, the last day's church, is this the best we can do? The last day's church isn't meant to be defined by stars and status and silliness and sin 
and sex appeal, but by power. We need the supernatural power of God. We do. We need the power of God because the power of God will usher in healing. The power of God will cause the sick to be healed in Jesus' name. We need the power of God because the power of God ushers in deliverance. Where people walk into a place bound up by whatever it is that they're afflicted by. And God, through His power, sets them free. This, this kind of verbiage is so foreign to churches these days. They don't even believe in the ministry of deliverance anymore. Go talk to your therapist. No, you need to have a little talk with Jesus. And let the saints lay hands on you and pray that God would break those chains and set you free by His power. Where signs and wonders and miracles are real and conviction is real and holiness is real. And somebody isn't ashamed or afraid to lovingly confront the culture that is determined to destroy itself. I'll tell you something, y'all. You started this, Kathy. Boldness needs to make a comeback. I hope I'm talking to somebody. Boldness needs to make a comeback. We've seen what happens when we sit down and keep our mouth shut. This is what happens. Boldness needs to make a comeback. We need to lift our voices to confront the culture who thinks that our silence is acceptance. It is not. This week, Kathy sent me an article about a, about a prominent Christian singer who leads a Christian band, and he's got millions of followers, but lately, he has started to take a bold stand on things that are going on in the world. And man, they are losing their minds. Even his fan base is like, well, just, just sing. Even his fan base is like, stop talking about this stuff and just sing. That's what we want you to do, as if that's the only voice that he has. And everything that he was saying was so bold. And I was saying, Lord, give us more of that. Yeah. I find myself living in a world in which discomfort is a regular part of my life. And I believe that it's for two reasons. Number one, firstly, I truly believe in the presence of principalities and powers. And I believe that in these days, they are pouring out everything that they've got. Amen. If you don't think so, you're not paying attention. Demonic spirits, principalities and powers ungodly foolishness is just being poured out all at once. It's as if they, they've saved everything to now and they're just throwing it all out there. It's just happening everywhere. And just as importantly, I'm convinced that I'm feeling this in my spirit because I believe that it's the Spirit of God stirring us up to say that this is not the way that it's supposed to be. This is not the way that it's supposed to be. People say, people say all the time, oh, that spirit stuff is weird. You know what's weird? Buckle up, buttercup. That spirit stuff is weird. You know what's weird? Trying to teach three, four, and five-year-olds about sexuality. That's weird. That's weird. And nobody balks about that, right? I'm not just preaching to a crowd. I'm just telling you the truth. Nobody seems to balk at that. But you do something that is spirit-inspired, and we've lost our way. When we openly disregard God's ways, openly, when we normalize sin and we mock righteousness, when you fight against the right to life, you fight against it. If ever there was a time when we need the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we need you now. Singers and musicians, if y'all will come, we're, I want us to just go after something. When there is so much hate in this world, he shows us how to love. When there is so much negativity in the world that we're living in, He encourages us, the Holy Spirit. When there are lies all around us, He, the Holy Spirit, shows us what the truth really is. When there is so much fighting and discord all around us, even in our churches, He gives us peace. He gives us the peace of God. I was raised in this, y'all. It was natural to us. It was natural to us to have services that went four hours. I don't know who was working the nursery those days, but they had to be some special people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like right now, it's 1116, and I'll promise you that somebody's going to walk up to me after church and go, really? Yeah. You ain't seen nothing. And y'all clapping. Y'all need to volunteer and get your tail in there and watch that nursery. Want the Holy Ghost to show up, but you don't want to wipe babies' butts. 
You start wiping butts, he'll show up. You need to walk out of that nursery sometimes with stinky fingers and have people tell you, man, you missed church today. Woo! Holy Ghost dropped down in there today. It was outside. Because you say, you know what? I'll be in there next week. He'll do the same thing again. So let's just create that as the atmosphere. Can we? See, I don't know where, what, what, what something like this says to some of y'all. I hope it's made some of you mad. That's my job. To stir you to that point where you say, I need this. Holy Spirit, we need you. Pastor Kathy, this morning... so thankful. I'm so thankful to be connected to such a strong woman of God. The Spirit of God in her life literally saved me so many times. This morning she came in here to huddle and just the atmosphere was stirred by her words. We need fresh oil. We need fresh fire. There are so many people in our culture today who are struggling, even in the church, just struggling to keep it together and hold it together and just make it through another day. That's not God's best for you, man. We're supposed to be fresh and flourishing. Last week I talked about exhaustion. This week I'm telling you what you need is the Holy Spirit of God. You need the Spirit of God in your life stirring you up every day. We're not going to duck and we're not going to walk around this because some people think that it's just strange. We're going to just say, let's lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Let's pray as a church. We've been praying in this church for months for revival. Yeah. Months. God, let revival fall. Yeah. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit of God to draw lost people. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to the house. We need the Holy Spirit to make us bold again. So today, in the name of Jesus, if you wouldn't just mind, just pray with me. Father, Holy Spirit of God, we need you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. You are welcome here. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome in our lives. You're welcome in this atmosphere. So come. And be here today. I was saved when I was eight years old. When I was ten years old, we had an evangelist that came to the church. And he was one of those fire-baptized, tongue-talking, holiness preachers. And they asked that day if anyone wanted to come and pray and receive the Holy Spirit. I was young. I was 10 years old. I said, yeah, I I, I want that. Because what they said was the Holy Spirit in you will remove the fear out of your life. As a little boy, I was afraid of a lot of things. They said the Holy Spirit will remove the fear out of your life and give you boldness. I was a skinny little 10-year-old boy. I said, I want that. I want that. Little did I know what he was going to do. This many years later, my life verse is Proverbs 28.1. The wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion bold in Jesus name this morning I don't know who in here might want to receive the Holy Spirit of God you say well I'm saved I've already got him but have you received him there's a difference what's the difference preacher here's the southern way of doing it let's just say your mother-in-law came to live in your house you might let her but have you really received her Did you really welcome her in there like, y'all know what I'm saying. Receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Altar workers, I want us today to lay hands on people. I want us to pray. People who just need a fresh anointing. And you know, this is not a one Sunday only thing. I'm going after this again next Sunday, so. (laughs) We're going to do it again. You know what? I just had a check. Maybe we'll let her go after it next Sunday and let her preach fresh oil, fresh fire, fresh... Come on, Jesus.
Last night for prayer. Wasn't gonna. Should I? God is here. God is here. And we have a strong feeling that He's staying, He's not leaving. Last night when we finished intercessory prayer, we were up here in a circle praying, and I sat, I had sat down on the altar. And there was a few of us here, and I heard as we were praying, I heard a man pray off my right shoulder in my right ear. As a former lawman, I, I don't like people close to me, so I opened my eyes to look and see who was there because there was not a man there. There was not a man there. There was, still was not a man there. Nobody standing there. I heard a man praying right there. I said that to the group there, and Kathy said, well, I heard the alarm beep a few minutes ago. It was as if somebody opened the door and came in. And I said, well, I heard this guy right here praying beside me. I know I heard a man pray. <laughs> Later, somebody sent me a message and said, it is the abiding presence of the Spirit of God showing up. And we didn't hear the alarm beep when he left, so he stays. So he stays. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's weird. Don't get me started. This morning, brothers and sisters, I want to I want to pastor a church that is in revival. I want to pastor a place where the Spirit of God is pouring out in that place where signs, wonders, and miracles are common, where healing and deliverance is happening, where so many souls are being saved and won to Christ that you can't. Somebody took my seat. Sit on the floor. So the Spirit of God can just move in a place. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Where broken lives can be put back together again. Where lost children will find their way back to their salvation in Jesus' name. All across the building, Father, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. There is nothing we want more. There's no one we want more than your presence, Lord. We want you here. God, we may have in the times past said it, but God, we are so, we're so desperate. We need you. Our culture is so upside down. God, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you in our churches, our homes, our schools. We need you in our leaders. God, we need you in our families. We need you, God, in our fathers and mothers. God, Holy Spirit, we need you. So we cry out, Holy Spirit, come. Inhabit the praises of your people. And don't just let it be a visitation, God. Let it be a habitation that you come and you abide with us. Holy Spirit, perform signs, wonders, and miracles even in this room here today. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Heads bowed all across the building and hearts open. I'm just going to give you an, an old-fashioned altar call invitation. And if somebody just wants to come and find a place to pray and kneel down and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Let God do that. If you wouldn't mind, all across the building, stand up on your feet this morning. All across the building. And anybody who wants to pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill this vessel. Come find a place. Stand, sit, kneel, whatever you want to do. Altar workers, just let Listen, two weeks ago, it's still echoing what Jake said two weeks ago in my, in my head, that when there's a movement, when there's an epic movement, it creates an atmosphere for another invitation, for, another invitation, for something else, for God to do something else. Yes. And we see, we've seen a couple of victories here, national victories lately. This is not the time for people to think, well, there's, God's not doing anything. God is definitely at work. God is most definitely at work. We need to pray for our nation because God can turn in a, in a moment what has taken years to destroy. God can repair that. God can turn it in a new direction. And our nation, y'all, desperately needs prayer. And his word is clear. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek their face and turn from their wicked ways, hear from heaven, forgive their sin, forgive, heal their land. He's ready. He's ready. Make it a part of your prayer life this week, every week, every day of this week. God, I'm praying for my nation. Pray for your leaders. You may not like them, but the scripture says pray for them. Pray for them, the people that are in authority. Let's pray that God will continue to do it. Kathy asked us earlier to pray for people in business. Businesses are closing at an alarming rate. It's, it's frightening. I don't know how many of you are business persons, business people. You own a business. You have a business. We are praying for you to prosper. Even in difficult times, we're praying for God to give you fresh insight, that God would show you what you need to do even in this crazy season that you can prosper. So, Because it's true that even in the, in the Word of God, that it tells us that 
Even in a time of famine, Jacob sowed and he received a hundredfold. So you can win even in times that it doesn't look like you can win. And listen, in the kingdom of God, we need you to win. We need you to tithe. We need you to, to give. We need you to be a part of that. So I'm not just going to go, oh, another business closed. No, the devil is a liar. We want you to prosper. So in Jesus' name, we're praying for you every day to prosper. And I feel God in here this morning. I feel God in here this morning. Honey, is there anything that you want to add? No? Let's pray together before we... Here it is, just verbalized in one simple sentence. If you are looking for skinny jeans and smoke machines, we're not the place. We are not the place. There's nothing wrong with that, and that, let them do their thing, but that's not us, and that's not who we are. We are old-fashioned, heartfelt, heaven-sent, Holy Ghost, God-loving people. And we're just going to... That's who we are. And that's what we're going to do. We put our boots on the ground every week in this community. Seven days a week, we have boots on the ground not just talking about it, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, providing things that need to be provided to this community. We do that every single week, and y'all make it happen. It's all it. Did you? Who said go ahead? Okay. All right. I will. Our pantry feeds 1,800 people a week, at least. That's a powerful thing. A powerful thing. Um, Dining with dignity, you guys, every 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 month, just crazy downtown. Over a hundred this week. You served a hundred hot meals, ribs, hamburgers. Good God Almighty! I wish I would have shown up when I saw the pictures. I was like, "Hello, Jesus." <laughs> Acts twenty nine. They were just out yesterday. Y'all were in. It looked like you were in hell. Where were you? Interlocking. Same thing. And they were like. Close. And I'm, anybody from Interlocking, I'm sorry. I own land in Interlocking. Repairing a, a woman's substructure in her house. Okay. That's awesome. Your giving makes that happen, so give generously. But I've got a strong feeling that the next thing that we're supposed to do is something that probably seems stupid. But the person who has been talking to me about this for the last three years refuses to let it go, so I'm going to be stupid with it. Come here, Nicole, please. Just, I, and I don't know why I'm doing it now, but I'm going to just throw it. Come on. This is Nicole Hallwood. She heads up our 4S ministry. Suit, sock, sweater, salvation. Sweater, sock, sandwiches, and salvation. I was so close. I was off by 1S. 4S. They minister to the homeless people. You got to do everything that they do. The next thing... That, we feel, she feels, we feel. More her than me, but I think she's right. We want to buy. We're going to buy. No, wait a minute, wait. You're going to buy. You're going to buy a shower truck. You're going to buy. You're going to buy. Check you. You're going to buy a shower truck that we are going to own, and we're going to take it wherever people need showers, hot showers. Nothing stupid about that. Serve Pro can clean it up if we make a mess. We can, we're going to do that, and it's anywhere between 80, 50, 80,000? Yeah. Okay. We need 100? Kathy says 100. We'll go with 100. Whatever we need, it'll be there. So I want us to pray, and, and then I'm going to let you all go home. But if you're a Texas millionaire, and you're sitting here, with 100K in your pocket ready to give it away. We're going to do this. We're, and it's just as soon as possible. She's been doing the legwork on it for three years. And then COVID came along and, and kicked it out. And then we, anyway, I know y'all are ready to go, but this is important. We're going to provide hot showers all over this community. They just pull the truck up, they hook it up, the shower, and then go, right? Yeah. And if I can say, Pastor, whenever I've talked about this, Pastor has said one shower can change someone's whole life. That's true. That's true. Don't you wish more people knew that? Yes. <laughs> it's true. A hot shower can change your life. It's the same as a haircut. A haircut can change your life, but a hot shower can change everything. And you see men and women in our community, and we could give them some dignity back with just a hot shower. So we're going to do it. Okay?
Okay, hands joined. Let's, good Lord, you're covered in oil. Let's pray. Father, today, thank you for everything that you're doing. My hand is so greasy. We thank you so much for what you're doing, God. I pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Continue to pour fresh oil on this house. Continue to do the work that you've started. But God, here we join our hands together today for another crazy thing. We ask you, God, to provide the need for a shower truck in this community. That, God, we could provide fresh, hot showers for anyone who wants one. So, Father, we know that if it's your will, it's your bill. So we trust you completely. We pray, God, that as we go, you'll make a way. And this church will jump in with all feet in Jesus' name. And they said together, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Fellowship is you.